I wasn't sure when I was going to film this video because I was hesitant to immortalize on camera the IV that is strapped to me, but this is my life. We're here. We're doing it. I read every single Elizabeth Strout novel, and I wanted to talk about it. Two caveats before I get into the meat of this video. The first is that this isn't going to be the complete Elizabeth Strout video. I mean, God willing, she's going to write more books, and so for that reason, this will eventually become out of date. But also, I only did as much research and scripting and consideration as I wanted to to keep myself enjoying myself while making this video, and I didn't want to push it into homework territory. So for all of that, number two, in many ways I do want to hand this video over to you. In the comment section, discuss everything I missed, discuss everything that you would love to talk about with regard to Elizabeth Strout and all of her work, and if you stumble across this video in the future, hello, my name is Matthew, nice to meet you. I hope that you are able to continue the conversation in the future, because I don't expect myself to do updates. With that out of the way, now we may begin. And where to begin? I suppose the first thing I want to talk about is what is an Elizabeth Strout novel? In an Elizabeth Strout novel, some things you may find are the idiosyncrasies of the working class, specifically the white working class. To the most minute details, Elizabeth Strout unpacks the behavior of working class people, her descriptions of their tics, the way that they speak and reference other people of different class, of different race, are all so authentic and so magnetic. She can take a character making the slightest gesture and somehow point to larger sociological implications, and that sort of mastery is what you're going to get in her books. Tailing that a little bit, she also unflinchingly embraces everyday cruelty. There is a lot of slight in her dialogue between characters, there's a lot of underhandedness, there's a lot of outright vitriol, and I think it is fun to watch the bitterness between people blossom. She never is concerned with moral goodness. She's more concerned with what it means to be nice, what it means to be polite, not necessarily what it means to be good. Also, in her books, you might find an immediate repression and then later processing of trauma. Her characters go through sometimes surreal life events, and it's fascinating to watch how in the moment they are able to snuff out any reaction or any experience that they do not want to actively be experiencing. The dissociation is real, but later in her books her characters often have to face those traumas, face those emotions and experiences, combine the bifurcated parts of themselves and reconcile with that. And the last thing I want to talk about that you might stumble across in an Elizabeth Strout novel is the desire to live another life and the resilience while being unable to do so. Often her characters are in a sort of means that they do not enjoy, whether that be an education level, the restrictions of a small town, age debilitating them in some sort of way, either old or young and under care. Every single one of Elizabeth Strout's books in some way deals with the ties that tether us to where we are from and how we can or cannot break free from those. And I do think that the strength of her characters is something that I'm very drawn to as they confront those ties. I don't know if this is the right order in which to discuss things. This is what I'm going with. The next thing I want to talk about is Elizabeth Strout's writing. Elizabeth Strout is a very concise and clean and elegant author. I never feel like I am being led astray when reading one of her books. She has a confidence, sentence after sentence, with a sort of dry, astute humor all throughout that makes me as a reader feel very comfortable while reading one of her books. I can take comfort knowing that I'm not going to be led astray or thrown to a metaphor that doesn't make sense or lost in a plot point that goes nowhere. I only ever feel 
pleasure while reading an Elizabeth Strout book. Within her writing concision, she also is incredibly limber. I find her to be able to pivot very quickly and zoom in and out of scope in a way that similarly feels comfortable, similarly feels so at ease. But for many authors, I'm sure that ease is something that you really have to work toward. And it's something that exists very much in her first book as her most recent book. She started with that skill and only carries it through. The last thing I want to discuss regarding what is an Elizabeth Strout novel is structure. And Elizabeth Strout really plays with two types of structure. I would consider all of her books to be novels in their own way, but some of them are more traditional linear through-line novels, and others are collections of short stories that accumulate and become a novel. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Next on my list of things to discuss is publication order and prizes. I just made a list of when the books came out and then what prizes or accolades they received. This is not extensive, this is the highlights. First we have Amy and Isabel, a debut that was published in 1998. This was shortlisted for the 2000 Orange Prize, which then became the Bailey's Women's Prize and now is the Women's Prize. It also was a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction. Her sophomore novel, Abide With Me, was published in 2006, eight years later, and not too much acclaim from what I can tell. I don't think it was longlisted or shortlisted for anything of note at least that I found discoverable on Elizabeth Strout's website or Wikipedia. Two years after that, we saw the publication of Olive Kittredge in 2008. It was the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction winner of 2009, a huge step up from nothing in 2006, and it also was a National Book Critics Circle Award finalist. From what I can tell, and of course if you find differently, correct me in the comments below, I believe Olive Kittredge was her first book to hit the New York Times bestseller list. Five years later, we saw the publication of The Burgess Boys, which I don't think was very successful according to what I could find. I did not see any accolades or awards for that one in particular. Following The Burgess Boys, three years later we saw the publication of My Name is Lucy Barton. This was in 2016. It was on the 2016 Booker Prize long list. It was on the 2018 Dublin Literary Award shortlist. And from what I can tell, this was the first of her books to hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Only a year later, Anything is Possible was published in 2017. This was the winner of the Story Prize in 2017. Olive Again was published in 2019, and this was an Oprah's book club pick, which I find to be incredibly charming. And most recently, in 2021, O. William was published, and this was the first of her books, from what I can tell, that was actually a Goodreads Choice Award nominee, which to me speaks of popularity, more than accolade, but popularity is its own accolade in its own right. Next, I think we should talk about the Elizabeth Strout literary universe. Much like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, all of Elizabeth Strout's books are in some way geographically or socially linked. There are three main towns that appear in her books, and two of them are actually main towns. We have Shirley Falls, Maine, Crosby, Maine, and then Amgosh, Illinois. I'm not going to dive too deep into the Elizabeth Strout literary universe. I'm not going to connect the dots on an intricate web of how all of the characters and locations are related to one another, because I don't necessarily think that you as a reader need to understand that to enjoy or appreciate appreciate her books. It is far more important in an Elizabeth Strout novel to understand the location of the story itself, not necessarily where a side character might come from or where we might have seen a side character previously, because likely that side character in one story had their own story to call their own and was substantive enough to carry itself. We don't necessarily need to know where they have progressed to appreciate their individual, more focused story more. That being said, characters from her standalone novels, Amy and Isabel, Abide With Me, and The Burgess Boys, appear in her series novels. And it is very much a treat to stumble across them. I do think that you could read these books chronologically in actual in-book timeline. I don't know if that would be the most effective way to read them, but I do think if you are curious about the progression of characters 
you could do so. This is kind of a messy portion of the video. I think it's neat, I think it's charming, but I think more important than knowing who all of the characters are and how they're all connected is knowing where the stories themselves take place. Maine is the oldest and whitest state in the United States. Illinois is a Midwestern state that south of Chicago is most known for farmland and wetland. And that means something in an Elizabeth Strout book, and I think knowing that is likely enough. That tells you far more than knowing that one character is a character from another story. Next I want to talk about my personal reading order and what the books plot-wise are actually about. I do want to bring up reading order specifically because I have a working theory that given how consistent Elizabeth Strout's books are, where you start with them might impact what you enjoy the most. In many ways, I could understand if a reader finds reading an Elizabeth Strout novel to be more of the same from book to book. I personally think there's more to it than that. But if somebody had that critique, I would understand it. Therefore, I do think where you start could impact your experience. The first of Elizabeth Strout's books I read was My Name is Lucy Barton, and this is the first book in the Omgosh, Illinois trilogy. My Name is Lucy Barton follows a character named Lucy Barton, who was recently admitted into the hospital, and her mother has come to spend time with her, to visit her while she recovers. And this book is very reflective, very meditative. It is the unpacking of the relationship between this mother and daughter, with stories sprinkled in for flavor. Lucy Barton is an author who has made a good career for herself and who has escaped her hometown, and her mother coming to visit her brings her back to what it was like to be in her hometown. And the book is them talking and processing and being passive-aggressive and thinking about things. The next book I read was the second book in the Omgosh, Illinois trilogy, and that is Anything is Possible. Anything is Possible is one of Elizabeth Strout's books that is a collection of stories that accumulate into a novel, or at least into an expression of a community. Anything is Possible takes place in Omgosh, Illinois, Lucy Barton's hometown. And Lucy Barton is a character that appears in these stories, is talked about in these stories, and we get to see some of the moments described in My Name is Lucy Barton given more depth in Anything is Possible. There are nine stories in Anything is Possible, eight of which are original to Anything is Possible. The story Snow Blind was originally published in the Virginia Quarterly Review. However, they all do fit into the story of one community. Next, of course, in my Elizabeth Strout journey, I had to cap off the Omgosh, Illinois trilogy with O. William, Elizabeth Strout's most recent publication. O. William takes us back to a more linear novel form. It follows Lucy Barton again, this time in partnership with her ex-husband William, as the two of them, later in their life, travel around and unpack their former marriage. Then I went back and read Olive Kittredge, which is the first of the Kittredge duology. At this point, who knows, she might write more. Olive Kittredge falls into the category of short stories collected, this time not only to paint the portrait of a community, in this case Crosby, Maine, but also to paint the portrait of a character, titularly Olive Kittredge. There are 13 stories in Olive Kittredge. They do progress at least slightly chronologically. Not all are from Olive's perspective, however, all feature Olive in some sort of way. And we do get to see the evolution of her character, and we do get to see her age throughout this book. Olive is a very surly, incorrigible, forthright main character who we, as a reader, get to find endearing over the course of the minutia of her actions and interactions. Then, of course, I had to read Olive Again. Olive Again is another collection of 13 stories, similarly about the main character, Olive Kittredge, following her later in life and progressing further into her life. Notably, the 13th story in Olive Again features the character Isabel from Amy and Isabel, and this is the one exception to what I said earlier where I do think knowing Isabel as a character does make this particular story more fruitful. Sociologically, the two Olive books are interesting because it is very clear that Elizabeth Strout was being influenced by how the presidencies at the time affected the way that these small towns and small town characters 
behaved. I finished my Elizabeth Strout journey with her three standalone novels. I did not go in publication order. I started with The Burgess Boys. The Burgess Boys is technically a story within a story, although that doesn't quite feel necessary for the book to work as it does. It follows particularly two men, the Burgess boys, who are returning to their hometown because their sister's son committed a hate crime. In their hometown, they have seen an influx of Somali immigration, and during Ramadan, the son in question throws a pig's head into a mosque. And this book seeks to explore the unraveling of that event. It's also about the family reconnecting, reconciling with their differing worldviews, and it's also a little bit of a legal story, talking about how these lawyer Burgess boys are going to defend or not defend the son in question. Then I read Amy and Isabel, Elizabeth Strout's debut novel. This is another linear novel following a mother-daughter relationship. The strains of a mother-daughter relationship when it is just them on their own in a repressive small town. And we get to see their interactions, their interactions with the outside world, what they seek to gain, what they yearn for, what they have to lose. If there is a main plot in this book, it is Amy, the daughter in question, having an inappropriate relationship with her teacher and the way that her mother experiences that and the way that Amy experiences that as part of her adolescence and coming of age. And then I finished my Elizabeth Strout reading journey with Abide With Me, which is another linear novel. All three of Elizabeth Strout's standalone books are linear novels. This follows the pastor of a small community on the brink of a nervous breakdown. He is newly a widower, taking care of his daughter, and constantly at the mercy of gossip and ridicule and it's about his relationship with his daughter and trying to raise her. It's about his relationship with his faith and how that's being put under a microscope and molded. And like a lot of Elizabeth Strout novels, it's also very community-centered. You do have a large cast of characters in this book, all experiencing their own deep, dark facets of life. So, now that we know what all of these books are about, when they were published, in which order I read them, some brief plot summary. Let's talk about what I am most excited to talk about, which is my ranking of every Elizabeth Strout novel. In this section, I'm going to go from least favorite to favorite, noting that I have loved each and every one of these books in its own way. I'm also going to talk about what I particularly enjoyed about each book, aside from what the books are about themselves. So, while I did enjoy it, my least favorite of Elizabeth Strout's books is The Burgess Boys. And I think this falls lowest on the list, mostly because I don't think that this book could work today. I don't think this book has the stay power of her other books. The way that she navigates this Somali community at tension with the oldest, whitest state in the country, it doesn't quite add up to what I think a contemporary conversation about a similar issue would look like. Elizabeth Strout in this book does choose to write from the perspective of a Somali man, and while I do think that that perspective was handled empathetically. I just don't think readers would be drawn to it today or think that it was a good choice today. In part, I think it is a strong choice because a lot of this book is about othering, is about the way that we think about and talk about other people. And to throw in that perspective allows a flip side of the coin that otherwise we would not experience. The thing about Elizabeth Strout that is so remarkable and made this book so pleasurable is that she writes so sympathetically about people doing awful things and people with really problematic worldviews. And so you're reading this book and you're reading the behaviors of these privileged white people and you start to think to yourself, well, it's not her fault she was born into money. Which is just never something <laughs> I would think about as a defense of a character who is acting morally against the ideology to which I ascribe, right? Like, I, I don't, I, I think it's funny to read a book and think that way about these kind of bad people who aren't really bad, right? I think that's very much the challenge that Elizabeth Strout poses with this book to the reader. How quick are you to judge? judgy people. Next in my ranking, I'm going to have to put Olive Kittredge, which I know is very scandalous because this is the Pulitzer Prize winner and this is a very beloved book. However, 
While I do think that Olive is an incredibly compelling character, I love her surliness, I'm drawn to it, I thought that the other characters in the other stories were more compelling. I thought that learning about her husband was a more pleasurable, exciting, nuanced experience than learning about Olive. We didn't really get a lot of Olive in this book in the way that I wish we had. There's also one story in particular that kind of goes off the rails in this book that involves a hostage crisis. I'm not going to spoil anything, but reading that just felt totally absurd, and while I understand why Elizabeth Strout put it in the book, for the characters to experience it in the way that they experienced it just didn't do it for me. I felt like it was a little surreal, almost as if Elizabeth Strout was like, what if this happened? And then she wrote it and then kept it. So for being a bit absurd in portions, I didn't care for this book. I also personally think that I'm just not as connected to Bush era commentary as other people might be, probably because I was a child during it and therefore don't think about it as much as I do something like the Trump era that I have actively and politically lived through. So yes, Olive Kittredge is an incredibly strong book, I just find other books by Elizabeth Strout to be far more interesting. Next in my ranking is Anything is Possible. I think Anything is Possible is lower on this list because I think that this is the book that stands most as a short story collection. This is the book that doesn't necessarily need a through line or community for it to work. If you replaced the characters' names with other characters' names and each story took place in a different location, I don't think much of this book would be lost. Therefore, it is an incredible short story collection, but if you know me, if you know my reading tastes, I don't always vibe with short story collections. They're not my favorite. There is one story in this book that is appropriately unhinged to the rest of the book, not like the story in Olive Kittredge. This one is similarly off the rails, but within the world that it has established enough for me to find it fascinating. I'm not going to say which story it is. If you have read the collection, maybe you know. So while I did appreciate this book as the collection of a community, I don't necessarily think that it worked as a novel in the same way that her other collections do kind of work as novels. And I really liked all of the Lucy Barton parts more. And I wanted to just hear more about Lucy Barton because this was her hometown. And we did get some of her and we did get some unpacking of the stories that were hinted at in My Name is Lucy Barton, but I found myself just wanting to reread My Name is Lucy Barton while reading this book. Next, in the middle of my ranking, Olive again, which in many ways to me fixed a lot of the problems of Olive Kittredge. We do get a lot more Olive in Olive again. This book is very much concerned with the later years of her life and the way that she feels burdensome to people, or the way that she strives for independence, or the way that she wants to relate to other people in her life. It's, it's a book that really does characterize her in a way that I found more exciting than the characterizations of other characters. And on top of that, the other characters were still incredibly strong, and their stories were incredibly compelling. So I think that this book just had stronger balance, and also, like I had mentioned before, this is a Trump-era novel. This is very much about how Trump's ideology started seeping its way into small towns, and I think that that was enriching for me to read in a way that a Bush-era novel just simply was not, by the age at which I am. Next in my ranking, and this was a debate between this book and the following book that I'm going to talk about in terms of which would be higher or lower. I feel like they're quite similar in terms of my feelings about them, but I'm going to have to put at least where I am in life now, O. William. O. William is the third book in the Omgosh trilogy. In this book, we get Lucy Barton again, and it was very exciting for me to return to Lucy Barton as a character, being in her mind, thinking the way that she thinks. I find her to be so exciting. And to see how she interacted with William, the two of them in this beautifully amicable relationship, despite not being together, and despite having had other marriages, and despite the faults and failings of them as parents, and despite the wreckage of their lives, just coming together and reconnecting and connecting and finding what made the other exciting to them 
in the first place. I found the spirit of rekindling to be so alive in this text, and the title itself is this exclamation. It's, oh, William. There is so much endearment embedded into the characterization of William, and there's so much love that you can tell from Lucy Barton's perspective toward William that is intoxicating to read. Coming in at number three is Abide With Me. I love this book. I think that this book, perhaps in like emotional investment, could be my number one pick from Elizabeth Strout. But in terms of execution, I do have to take it down a little bit. It's not as strong as the remaining two books on my list. It's a story of resilience, something that I particularly enjoy. I love the really insidious world of gossip that this book is built upon. I found the very us against the world attitude that the father had in his relationship with his daughter to be such a driving force throughout the entire book. Its explorations of grief and doubt I thought were so sensitive and so supple. And again, no spoilers, but I do feel like a lot of readers might read the ending of this book and think that it is trivial or trite, but to me it felt appropriate. To me it felt heartful. It felt vital. And I think that the psychological through line of this main character that we get throughout the book is more taught than readers might give proper credit to. I think given how insular the world she presents is, and how specific the impact of emotional trauma plays in the behaviors of her characters, I, I, I think it's just so intricate and so small and something to protect. But I do think that parts of it are messy. There is a side character plot line that goes a little bit nowhere, and I will concede to that. But in terms of the main core story, 100% on board, loved this book. Coming in at number two is Amy and Isabel, which, oh my goodness, this is a debut novel, and to think that Elizabeth Strout debuted with such strength. I mean, obviously it's a feat that she has carried that strength and evolved, that strength throughout the rest of her books, but like, this is so good. This is so strong. In many ways, it's the least Elizabeth Strout of Elizabeth Strout's books. This book is a lot more fluid. While its themes are very consistent with other Elizabeth Strout books, the way that they are explored feels differently textured. I think that what is so beautiful about this book is that mother-daughter relationship, is that strain, is that delicious bitterness between the two. And props to Elizabeth Strout, no other author could write so perfectly, so elegantly, so enthrallingly about a fart. There's a scene where a character farts in this book, and it is the most fascinating most psychologically devastating scene you will ever come across in a book. Like, only Elizabeth Strout could. The fart becomes this manifestation of all of the badness between a relationship. It becomes the most prominent image throughout the text for me. And this is a text with very vivid images. But this scene is so good, and I will forever refer to it when talking about books, because Again, only Elizabeth Strout could. She took a fart, like the most human thing, the most human, and made it something exquisite to read about. And for that alone, this book deserves to be at number two. But there's a lot more to it that I find interesting. I think that this book really develops the idea of wanting to break out of where you are in the most interesting way. I think particularly of two things. Amy as a character is very much the embodiment of that idea. She does not want to be where she is in life. She wants to be older. She wants to be more mature. She is desperate for that coming of age. She is seeking life events well beyond where she should be. And we have Isabel, and I think her exploration of that theme is a little bit more subtle. Isabel's crafting as a character felt so beautifully meticulous. Her constant doubting of the pronunciation of words and how she wishes she knew how to pronounce things because it would make her feel and sound smarter. And if she were smarter, she could escape somehow the status of where she lives. Or her jealousy towards her daughter, who is this more free-spirited, ambitious person. Or the way that she relates to others at work and how 
she views herself above or below them. I do feel that while Amy's track is the most novel-like, I feel like it is the driving force of the book, to watch Isabel experience it is all the better. Lastly, coming in at number one is My Name is Lucy Barton. Now, My Name is Lucy Barton was in my favorite books of 2021 video. If you have not watched that video, I will link it below for your pleasure. I talk a lot about this book in that video, so if you want more words of admiration, check it out. To me, My Name is Lucy Barton is just everything that makes Elizabeth Strout incredible. It is Elizabeth Strout at her absolute best. Every theme that I have discussed in this video, every character dynamic, every positive that I have given is in this book, and in this book so well. I personally love books about strained mother-daughter relationships, so this book has that going for it for sure. I think that Lucy Barton is a fascinating character. She is the character who got out. She is the character who not only got out but became a writer and writes about things that she has experienced and so in that way is still tethered to her hometown and never can escape it. So to see her in a hospital feeling helpless then visited by her mother, her mother who stands for everything from her small town and who did not treat her particularly well growing up, she's suddenly there to take care of her or at least help pass the time and the two of them don't particularly get along. The two of them have a deep and undescribable love for one another, or perhaps not even love, but obligation to one another. For them to be there feels only like a confrontation, only like an opportunity to reconcile. And through so much unspokenness, <laughs> through them not talking and them reflecting and Lucy Barton trailing off into memory and her mother sitting in silence or making very specific facial expressions like, do we get to see their relationship evolve? I find it to be fascinating. I think that this book is just a beautifully isolated little moment. And in that moment, anything can flourish. I think that it is so good. It's so strong. I only have generic gushy adjectives to describe this book. It's amazing, it's beautiful, it's perfect, I love it. It's tough for me, it's tough for me sometimes because the more I love a book, the harder it is for me to articulate why I love a book, but I just hope that my enthusiasm radiates enough at you to inspire you to consider picking it up. Which helps me nicely transition into my next thought, which is, where do I start? I would recommend starting, if you are looking to read Elizabeth Strout, with My Name is Lucy Barton. I think if you were to only read one Elizabeth Strout book, this is the book that you should read because like I said earlier, it is her at her best. If, however, if the short story structure is more enticing to you, go for Olive Kittredge. It's a solid book. I don't think it's her best book, especially having read others, but I think it is, again, an example of what Elizabeth Strout is. And yes, you could start anywhere. You could read any of the Omgosh books or either Olive book and still have a very good experience. Just my personal opinion. The only book that I would avoid starting with is Amy and Isabel. Just because I feel like Amy and Isabel is unlike any other Elizabeth Strout book. It's still very much an Elizabeth Strout book concerned with the same ideas, everything I've mentioned before, but it stylistically just doesn't quite feel the same as the rest of her canon. Now I have on my outline here a spot for concluding thoughts. I don't know if I have any concluding thoughts? I think that you should read an Elizabeth Strout novel. I hope that my enthusiasm and my breakdown here has inspired you to if you have not yet, or perhaps inspired you to pick up another if you already have, but I think Elizabeth Strout, like an author like Marilyn Robinson, is an incredible example of what American literature can look like, what really strong writing from the US can look like. And she's very concerned with a very specific part of the US, and it's not as expansive as other authors might be seeking to explore, but it's so well done in its specificity, and can show such an intricate portrait of one part of life. A part of life that is prevalent, and active, and 
that we engage with. I mean, her writing is so perfect and so delicious. Like, read her for that reason alone, just to experience really strong, confident authorship. But I think she is getting at the heart at something in a way that other authors are not, and I think that that is something to take note of. But like I said at the beginning of this video, I am now handing this video over to you. It is yours now. Comment below and talk everything Elizabeth Strout. I will try my best to stay up to date in the comments and engage with you. We can gush about her, we can debate about her. If there is something I missed, if there is something you feel I have misrepresented, put it all below. Let's, let's make this a hub of Elizabeth Strout conversation. And that's it for me. I'm going to go edit the many minutes of footage that I have just filmed and hopefully make something coherent and interesting, and you will have watched that if you made it to this point. If you have any questions, thoughts, comments, opinions, or beliefs about anything that I've talked about in this video, put those below. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you soon.